Hi, I'm Stephanie Jessup, and this is my sign name. Welcome to Dibs on Blue. Ready to learn Pendulum? Thank you, patrons and Stonemaier Games, for sponsoring this video. This game is for one to five players and takes around an hour to an hour and a half to play. In Pendulum, players compete to become the new king or queen. The game includes sand timers, which really makes it feel like the balance of control is constantly changing. By the game's end, you want more power, more points, to become the new ruler. But during gameplay, players aren't really taking turns. This game is a real-time game, meaning player actions happen at the same time, which makes for a pretty thrilling game. But if you want to play more casually, you don't have to use the sand timers. You can use the included time board if you're still learning the game and need a minute to figure it out. There are four rounds in the game, so you can always use the time board for the first round and then use the sand timers from then on. To set up, place the game board in the middle of the table. The side you use depends on the number of players. One side is for one to three players, and the other side is for four to five. Place the council board, phase lists, and worker action summary cards nearby. Separate the red and blue reward cards and the one reward card with the gold back, which represents the grande worker reward. That gold card is placed face up on the council board in the space matching the card. Shuffle the red cards and place them face down on the council board. Shuffle the blue cards and remove 10 of them back to the box. Place the blue cards on top of the red cards. Now flip five cards face up on the council board. The one space on the board is permanent, a card doesn't go there. The main board has three different colored sections where the matching colored sand timers should be placed. Put each sand timer in the first gold circle of each area. The purple area also needs three small time tokens in each of the other empty circles. Shuffle the achievement cards and place them face down on the board. Then flip one card face up. If there are four or more players, the legendary token should be placed on the face up card. For a one to three player game, it should start on the achievement deck. Shuffle the province cards and place them face down on the board. Then flip four province cards face up. Each player needs to choose a character board, which has two sides. If you're familiar with the game, you can use the advanced side. There are also advanced cards for each character. Each player also needs the four strategium cards matching their character symbol on their character board. Players hold those cards throughout the game. Players also choose the color they wish to play and take the privilege marker, achievement marker, three common workers, and one grande worker of that color. Each player also gets a worker action summary card to place nearby to help remember what to do during the game. Players also need 10 vote tiles, two 10 vote tokens, 10 red military cubes, 10 blue culture cubes, 10 gold cubes, and set them nearby, which serves as a player's personal supply or bank. Then take a look at your character board and move over the amount of resources matching the starting amounts on the board. Place a power marker, prestige marker, popularity marker, and legendary marker on the start of each point track. The lengths of the point tracks vary on the character boards. 
Place one common worker and one grande worker on the character board. The two common workers left are placed nearby in your bank. The other grande worker of your color is placed near the council board. You can only use the workers on your character board during the game, but as the game progresses, you'll be able to earn the others. Then you can use those too. If a worker or other resource runs out, you can't trade with another player. Your resources are yours and theirs are theirs. Everything is limited except votes. Should you need to put votes on your character board but you run out, use the 10 vote token to represent 10 votes. If those run out, then use something else. In a two-player game, choose one of the colors not in use, for example red, and place one worker in each of the small gold boxes in the purple and green areas. Just place a mix of common and grande workers randomly on the board. Once you place them, they'll stay there for the whole game. They won't be moved. And that's so the game feels like there's a third player, which you'll see more about. Anyway, mix the player's privilege markers and randomly place them on the privilege track. In a two-player game, the privilege marker of the color you're not using, in this example red, is placed in the last spot with three vote tokens by it. The player on the top of the privilege track goes first and takes precedence over the other players, but the order won't stay like that the entire game. The order will change, so don't worry about that, you'll see. And now, you're ready to play. The player in first privilege order goes first by placing their grande worker in one of the gold boxes. For example, if you place your worker in the green area, you will later pay two gold to move your worker down to the action below it. Or you can choose the other action after paying the two gold. There's no limit to how many workers that can be in a gold box. However, there are placement rules you have to follow. If you want to place a common worker and there's already a common worker in that box, then you can't place that worker. However, you can place a grande worker. It doesn't matter if there's a common or grande worker already there. In the black area, you can place any size workers in the boxes, no matter what workers are already there. If the row has a sand timer, you can't place workers in that row. In order to place workers, the row must not have a sand timer. And you can move those workers around as you're deciding where to place them. But if a row with a sand timer has workers, you can't move those workers. So the player first in privilege order goes first and places their grande worker from their character board onto the main board. Then the second player in privilege order does the same. In a two player game, don't worry about the third color, in this case red. You won't be placing any more red workers on the board. Then it's the first player's turn again. That player places their common worker on the board. The second player then does the same. Now, at the same time, all of the sand timers are flipped to the other rows. Green flips to the other row, black flips to the other row, purple also flips, but one of the small time tokens is then knocked off the board. So during the game, all players are constantly reviewing the board, seeing which rows have sand timers and which ones do not. 
If a row doesn't have a sand timer, players are free to place workers in the gold boxes there, following the placement rules, of course. But at the start of the game, all of the workers are now in rows that have sand timers. So this means the workers in those rows have to stay there and can complete actions. You don't have to do actions if you don't want to, but you can't move the workers from those rows because the rows have sand timers. You would have to wait for the sand timer to run out. When a sand timer runs out, any player can flip the timer to the other row in that area. Then the workers can be moved to a row without a sand timer. At times during the game, you may forget to do actions. And if you forget, oh well, if the sand timer of a row you're in runs out and someone flips it, you're out of luck doing your action. So sometimes that may happen. As you play the game, you'll become more aware of how it works, constantly looking over the board to make sure you do your actions. So what do you do when you're ready to do your actions? Well, decide which action you want to complete, then move your worker down to the action box below it. You can move any workers down to the actions, no matter their size. Also, if multiple players want to complete the same action, that's okay too. They can all go there. But first, you must pay the cost of the action. The arrow shows what you have to pay, for example, two gold. So you remove two gold cubes from your character board, putting them into your bank. If you can't pay, then you can't complete that action. So once you pay, you can resolve that action and earn something. If you earn a point, move your point marker up one on that track. If you get to the end of a track, you can't earn anymore. If you earn votes, move them from your bank to your character board. If you earn a resource like gold, military, or culture, move those cubes from your bank to your character board. If you see a multicolor cube symbol with a number, it just means that you earn any resources of that amount. If it's more than one, you can earn different kinds of resources. Each resource has a limit of 10 allowed on your character board. If you earn a map, it means you control a province. That action costs four military. So you'd remove four military cubes from your character board, placing them back into your bank. Then you can take one face-up province card or draw one from the top of the deck. If you take a face-up card, you can replace it with a new one, but you don't have to. Any player at any time can replenish those cards, drawing more face-up. Any player can do that, and you just may want to force another player to do that using their playtime to replenish the cards. Anyway, once you take a card, rotate it any way you want and slide it under your character board. The bottom symbol of the card must match the color of the symbol you're sliding it under. There isn't a limit to how many cards you can slide under your character board, but once you put them there, they have to stay. You can't change them around later on. Later, I'll also explain that you'll have to whittle these cards down to two for each column, so just keep that in the back of your mind that eventually you'll only be allowed to have two for each. If you're resolving an action with a question mark, it means you'll earn something under your character board, 
matching that symbol color. At some points during the game, you may have to figure out who takes precedence. For example, if two players go to choose the same province card, in that case, take a look at the privilege order. Whoever is first takes precedence over the other player. In this example, by getting to choose the province card. Make sure you always complete one action before completing another. So after resolving an action and earning something, the workers stay in that action row with a sand timer, since action rows with sand timers mean workers can't be moved. If a sand timer runs out, any player can flip it to the other action row in that area. If a sand timer runs out, it doesn't matter how slow someone flips it to the other row. Lifting a sand timer means it's gone from that row and on the other row no matter how long it takes to flip it and put it there. But if you start to flip a timer and another player is in the middle of resolving their action, the sand timer can still be flipped. But the other player can still complete their action. Be aware that you don't have to flip sand timers if they run out. You can just leave them there if you want. And if you flip one, you don't have to announce to the whole table that it's been flipped. Just flip it and keep it to yourself. So throughout the game, everyone is always looking over the table, seeing which sand timers need to be flipped. Anyway, remember if a row doesn't have a sand timer, workers are free to move around and be placed. And that may mean even placing the worker back in the gold box of the action row that just had a sand timer removed. Also be aware that there are a few things players can do at any time during the game. Remember during setup, each player gets four strategium cards. Well, at any time, you can play one of those cards onto your character board. Then you'll earn whatever is on that card. The rulebook explains all of the cards, but for example, it may allow you to earn any one resource. Another example is to pay any eight resources of whatever types. Returning them to your bank and earning one of your common workers. Place it on your character board, and now you have an additional worker to place on the main board to complete actions. But be aware there's a limit of four workers per player. Also, at any point during the game, you can pay five culture cubes, returning them to your bank, to pick up any played strategium cards on your character board, returning them to your hand to be played at any time again. At any time during the game, if you have resources equal to or greater than the resources required on the achievement card, take your achievement marker and place it on the card. You don't have to pay the resources, you just have to have them. In the first round of a two-player game, the legendary token will be on the deck. But with four or more players, the token will be on the card. In that case, if you have the required resources and you place your achievement marker on the card, you have to decide if you want to take the token or earn the benefits on the card, not both. If you decide to take the token, remove it from the card to your bank. Then move the legendary point marker up one. 
You need that point to win the game. If you don't earn that point, you can't win. So it's very important. Once you earn that point, you can't earn it again. So you can't take the token in the future. If you take the token, another player can't take it in that round. They would have to earn the benefits on the card and perhaps earn the legendary point another way, which you'll see in a moment. So during the game, the sand timers are constantly flipping back and forth. But remember, when you flip the purple sand timer, a small time token is knocked off. Knocking off the last small time token triggers the last round. If there are workers in rows with sand timers, they can complete actions at this time. If sand timers run out, don't flip them since it's the last round. After players complete any actions they want to take, it's time to call counsel. The reference card phase list explains what to do. First, you set the privilege order. Each player counts how many votes they have on their character board. If you have the most, you move your marker first on the privilege track. Second most would go second, and so on. In a two-player game, remember the color not being used, for example, red here, is not a real player. It always has three votes. So if there's a tie, for example, if you're second and have three votes, and red is third with three votes, well, red advances to the second position, moving you down to third. The three votes next to the red privilege marker stay there. That never changes. But for the real players, votes are discarded from their character boards back to their banks. They don't stay on the character boards. Then you move to the gaining reward step. The player in first privilege order goes first, earning any two points on their character board point tracks. For example, maybe one power and one popularity point. They also earn one council board reward card, so they just look that over and pick one. You can always choose to earn the rewards from that one area that isn't a card. It's just always there. If you choose the card where the common worker becomes the grande worker, then remove one of your common workers and replace it with your grande worker next to the council board. Now you have another grande worker to use from then on. Flip the card over after choosing that reward. Next time you call council, that card will be flipped back over, becoming available again. But if you've already chosen it before, you can't choose that card again. If you choose a card with a lightning symbol, that means that reward happens now, one time. For example, earning five gold cubes. After taking them from your bank, discard the card and don't replenish it. If you choose a card with the sun symbol, for example, paying two gold to get one popularity point, that symbol means it's a stratagem card. You'll take that card and add it to your other stratagem cards. Remember, you can play those cards at any time. If you don't know what a card means, that's okay. The rulebook explains all of them. Nearing the end of the game, the red reward cards will become available. Those have a symbol like a trophy. Choosing those means you must pay something to get something. For example, pay any 10 resources to earn the legendary point if you haven't earned it yet. Then you move to the third step, checking the maximum province cards. Here you have to check if you meet the required limit for those cards. You can have two cards in each column. If you have more than two in a column, you must discard some to get down to two cards. When the reward cards run out, the game is over. If they haven't run out, you move to step four, setting up the round. 
If the gold reward card is face down, flip it back over so it's available again. Discard all of the other cards back to the box and draw five new cards. Discard the face-up province cards and draw four new ones. If the achievement card has achievement markers on it, return them back to the players. Discard the card and draw a new one. In a 1-3 to three player game, the legendary token will be on the achievement deck, so now it gets placed on the new face-up one for the second round. If a player has the legendary token, it's placed on the new face-up card. All of the small purple time tokens are returned to their spots. Don't flip any sand timers just yet. Then you'll move to the last step, placing or moving workers. In privilege order, players place workers in rows that don't have sand timers. Follow privilege order to take turns as always. Then all of the sand timers are flipped. After the fourth round, the game is over. If a player has all of their point markers in the gold area of their character board, that player wins. If there's a tie, count how many points the tied players have in that gold area, and the tied player with the most points wins. For example, if a player has 8 and another has 6, the player with 8 points wins the game. If there's still a tie, the tied player in first privilege order wins. If players don't have all of their markers inside the gold area, check for the last marker closest to the gold area. For example, if you need three points to get your popularity marker in the gold area, and another player needs four to get their power marker into the gold area, then you win. If there's still a tie, the tied player in first privilege order is the winner. Remember, you always need the legendary point to win the game. If no one has that point, there is no winner. Remember, if you want to play a more casual game, you can use the time board. You still flip the sand timers, but you ignore the actual sand in them. The time board explains which timers to flip. Then, once all players have completed their actions, you move to the next row on the time board, which explains which sand timers to flip. Once all players have completed actions, you move to the next row, and so on. When you get to the bottom of the time board, you finish that last round and call council. Well, that's it for Explaining Pendulum. If you've enjoyed watching, subscribe and click the bell icon to be notified when I post a new video. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Dibs on Blue Games. If you're interested in supporting the channel, check out the Patreon link in the description below. There you can get access to a monthly video where I teach ASL words and sentences through the use of board games. I use my voice for those, but they're all captioned, of course. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below and I will gladly respond. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.